Hello, everyone, and welcome to Your Daily Detroit. It is Tuesday, March 12th, 2024. I am Jer Stays, and joining me on the other side of the line is... Fletcher, you know, this episode of Your Daily Detroit was first recorded at the studio at Tech Town. But uh, there's was so much news. People need to know we are coming back for a second take of this show because we basically had to throw the whole darn thing out. Yeah, we uh, we finished recording. We wrapped and I went to go do some more day job stuff. And I sat down and looked up and I was like, oh, OK, notification from ESPN. And it's like, oh, the Lions signed someone. I'm like, all right. And then it's like the Lions traded. And I was like, ooh. And then Jared texted me like, we need to do some stuff. And I was kind of like, well, maybe another. And then it's like, no, this is all all right. Like, OK, well, we're going to re- we're going to do this again. I think first, you know, we're going to do Lions. We're going to do some Pistons and Troy Weaver. And we're going to do a little Detroit City FC as the season for the club is starting on Saturday. But first, we need to start with the Lions. A trade has been made. Quarterback Carlton Davis is coming to town from the Buccaneers. He's also coming with a sixth round pick from the 2025 and 2024 drafts. And in return, the Buccaneers are getting the 2024 third round pick. I feel like this could work out as a really good deal. He was on their uh, he was on their Super Bowl team. I know that there are some negatives. I know you're going to get into them, but uh, maybe this might work out for us and this is an area where we actually have some pain. Yeah, I it could it's a it's a big risk and so far all the risks that Brad Holmes have made with the Lions have paid off when he's maybe drafted a player too high or done something somewhere else and it's worked out really great. It's a bit of a risk uh, because while Carlton Carlton Davis is a starter for the Buccaneers, he does have a Super Bowl ring from the 2020 Super Bowl championship where Tom Brady led that team and won and made everyone forget, you know, his off season troubles. Um, Davis has missed 16 games in three seasons, which if you don't know, 16 games is essentially a full season of football. So, like, that's concerning. Um, with him being out and being rusty, his tackling has kind of slipped up a little bit. We noticed that was with C.J. Gardner-Johnson. When you are out for a long time and you're getting back into the rhythm of playing a sport that requires, like, precision timing, you tend to, like, miss on the small things, like open field tackling. But I will say, when we got to see Carlton Davis twice last year, as the Buccaneers put the Lions twice, uh, the Lions won both those games. But Carlton Davis, in those two games uh, against the Lions, was targeted, I think, about 19 times for a total of 29 yards. So, like, that's good. I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean that he might have been the number one corner, but, like, that means that whoever he was on for most of the time, if they caught a pass, did not go very far. But it looks like they probably didn't catch many passes. So that's a that's a relief to have to have a corner who has some pedigree in terms of, you know, getting in people's faces. Um, but, yeah, having a Super Bowl ring, bringing bringing in that veteran presence, even at 27 years old. He's not that old, but, you know, still a veteran. It's helpful to this team, especially the team that, you know, thrives off energy. You think that someone coming into a situation like that is probably going to feel a little bit pumped up. So a little bit of a helpful thing to have. And like we said, the corner is where they struggled the most. Um, we'll be losing Kendall Vildor, uh, Will Harris, Jerry Jacobs, Khalil Dorsey, and Chase Lucas. Vildor and Jerry Jacobs being free agents, that's fine. <laughs> that's okay because they were toast, like literal burnt toast on the corners. So to see them leave, anyone would be better as an upgrade than those. But to get someone who actually has a ring and can understand the concepts to play, I'll happily take that on the outside. And even if he's not the number one corner on the depth chart, like he's been a number one corner before. So like he's handled number one receivers before. So maybe even if even if Cam Sutton is technically above him, the pecking order, uh, he can still handle someone switching over to his side and being capable of doing that. And that's honestly all you can ask for at first. Naturally, you want to build from before. But I know the Lions want to put money into keeping the players they have. So that means sometimes you sacrifice bringing in some of the much larger names and making smarter picks instead. 100%. A couple other things uh, we need to talk about Marcus Davenport. So kind of how the Buccaneers were like, we're sad to see him go, but we understand. 
<laughs> the Minnesota Vikings were not sad at all to see Marcus Davenport leave their roster and come to the Lions. Um, the Lions signed Marcus Davenport and Edge Rusher for a one year, six point five million dollar contract, which with incentives could go up to ten. Um, Davenport, a edge rusher, was almost drafted by the Lions, who instead uh, were able to get Frank Ragnow. We see how that turned out. Uh, Davenport is on his third team in his very short career. It's really because he cannot stay healthy. When healthy, he's a really good contributor on the defensive line. He can make a tackle back there. He can get a sack or two. But the problem is, is he's just unable to stay healthy. Between now and and 2018, uh, he has not played a full season, full 16, 15, 16, 17 game season. The most he's played is 15 in 2022. He has missed time with a fractured thumb, a toe sprain, list frank fracture, elbow and toe injuries, a concussion, two shoulder injuries, totaling six games, a calf injury, an ankle injury, and then another ankle injury from last year, which and he played four games, started three, had his ankle injury, and did not play the rest of the season. Also included, he had five off-season surgeries in 2020. So, like, the one-year deal, like, I know you hear all that, and you're like, oof. But a one-year deal means a show-me deal. And a show-me deal is basically, your damaged goods, here's a one-year contract, show us you can stay together for a year and play well, and may I offer you more money. If not, no harm lost, we just don't need to keep you on the roster. So with a deal like this, he might not even make it past training camp. He might get there, play hard, do something, and they're like, oof, nope, cut. So it's really, the onus is really more on him to show why he should be on the starting 53-man roster as opposed to, you know, them taking a, a gamble on someone being there for the entire 17-game season. And... Uh, sadly, one, one thing that kind of stings a bit, the Lions were really good last year because they were able to keep, uh, Jared Goff on his feet. Um, as we saw a lot of the time last year, uh, when he was not pressured, he was one of the best quarterbacks in the league. Statistically, when he was, he was one of the worst part of the front line that did that was, uh, included Jonah Jackson, who unfortunately signed with the Rams, uh, now, Jonah was maybe like the weaker link of all the offensive linemen, but he was still pretty good. Now, he wasn't rated very well overall, 34th out of 79 guards of last year, but he was a pro bowler not that long ago, two years ago. So, like, he didn't really decline that much more from that. And you kind of wondered if this was going to happen when the Lions re-signed Graham Glasgow to a three-year, which is great. Love to have him back. But they figured you're choosing between Graham or Jonah, and Graham had a much better season than Jonah last year. So if it's between the two of them, you got to go with recency bias, unfortunately. So while it stinks to let Jonah go, um, the Lions have a chance to draft someone to fill his spot. It's a glaring hole, but you have most of an offensive line already set. Um, if you can put in, you know, some young stud to fill that gap in and keep your quarterback upright, the Lions should be okay on the offense going forward. So in homes we trust? In homes we trust, I guess. Yesterday, the Detroit Pistons beat the Charlotte Hornets for the third time this year, which puts them at 11 wins for the season, <laughs> which is one more than someone said they would win <laughs> back when they had five wins. It wasn't me. I was certain they'd get over 10 wins, but someone, someone said that they would not. Oh, ye of little faith was me. At least I get solace in watching what was an epic James Wiseman dunk. That was great. It was a nice little pro step dunk on a, on another player, and the bench loved it. Honestly, like again, they're at eleven wins, which this is going to be t be really telling of another team. I mean, we're, we're celebrating eleven wins here, friend, which puts them tied for the worst record in the league, tied with the Washington Wizards, who did not have a historic NBA losing streak. They just stink. And the funny part about it is, is Kyle Kuzma, who's from Michigan, uh who plays for the Wizards is like, when you play against the Pistons, you want to make sure you're not the team that, you know, loses to them because they're bad. Like, you're just as bad as them now, man. Like, and the thing is, a lot, the Pistons have an excuse having a losing streak that uh, spans 25 plus 26 games. You don't have that excuse. Why are you just as bad? Anyways, though, Pistons are definitely not making the playoffs. So, like, this isn't like a popping champagne like we did. They're not making the playoffs. But, like, 
it shows that they, they have some fight. And the thing I like the most, this game he did not play very well, but Jaden Ivey's been playing great the past few games. Uh, playing with Cade Cunningham is like finally getting them to play together has been great watching. Simone Fontecchio, who they got in a trade with Utah, who I was not very high on because I've only watched him be good against the Pistons, has settled right in in this Pistons team. So hopefully they can get him to come back for maybe a year or two because he's really shown to appreciate playing with this roster and his shooting opens up more lanes for the Pistons to attack the hoop, which is great. I know they're not winning, but they're a young team. If they can attack and play hard the way they're playing, I know some people want to get more high higher percentages for the first overall draft pick, but like, I want to see them play hard, get the first overall draft pick. If you lose the games, but play hard, don't go in there and like, Oh, what do you know? We're going to go out there and try a hard, Go out there and play some ball like you guys know how to do. Like, I know you guys hate losing as much as the fans do. So, like, just go leave it on the court. And they're doing that for the final games, and I can appreciate that. Speaking of fans hating how they're losing, though, this clip with Troy Weaver that has been making the rounds, I think we need to talk about it because, man, to me, it's never a good look when you've got your general manager and a fan going at it in the stands and, like, a fan yelling, you suck at your job. And then the general manager being like, I'm going to beat your ass. Like, you know, it's it, it's not a good look in general, in my opinion. And it's but it also shows the fans frustration. Look, there, there were chance of sell the team this year so far. I'm not saying that 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 the Pistons general manager, Troy Weaver, or even anyone else in the front office should not be immune to like criticism because you built this team. You built the stinker. We gave Brad Holmes all the praise for building, you know, a team in Detroit. That is, you know, a division championship and such. You built this stinker on, in, on the flip side. So, like, we got to give you most of the blame for that. It falls on some of the players. It falls on the coaching. It falls on the construction of the team. However, I think going up to him and telling him you suck at your job, you then can't play the victim when he responds with, you're lucky I don't beat your ass. Like, you can't then be like, what? What? Because, like, come on. Like, if I walked up to some of these people at their jobs and their cubicles or you know, at their fire truck or at whatever kiosk they're at, or even at, you know, their CEO company. I'm like, you suck at your job. You suck at your job. You'd also have me escorted off the premises too. Especially if you were having a down streak of whatever, where you thought you'd be your firefighter thinking you'd save all these people. And instead of that, you've had a month and a half of people's houses just burning down left and right. If I was like, you suck at your job, you might put me in a headlock. Rightfully, rightfully so. I'm not saying that he's not good at his, he's not bad at his job because they're 50 and 251 and 229 after last night's win in these last three years. And that's very bad. Like, I don't really know numbers, but I do know when one number is higher than the other and it's behind the number that's smaller. It's not good percentages. It's bad percentages. So they're not doing very great. But I don't think telling him you suck at your job. Like that is the best way to go about it. I especially don't think that when you're doing it with a camera phone on you, because we don't know what you said before you started hitting for you started hitting play. Troy Weaver is known as like typically a more dry kind of dry humor, not as excitable type of guy. I mean, some stuff happens. Yes, the team plays well for sure, but he's not someone who just flies off the handle like that. So to see him respond like that to someone leads me to believe something else was said. And then someone was like, ooh, security's coming. Put your phone on before the guy switched his tune up. There have been plenty of times for sure where you've seen on camera people saying stuff like, "What? why am I getting kicked out? And then it comes out. They said something horribly offensive for the cameras walked over there. I'm not condoning one way or the other, but I do find it very funny that like when fans say these things to athletes that or other people and the people confront them. All of a sudden, their tune changes. One thing that sticks in my mind, indelible moment, uh, Marcus Peters, when he played for the, for the Los Angeles Rams, uh, he was having a not great game, and he came off the field. And one of these fans, I won't repeat exactly what he said, was like, you suck, such and such and such and such. And Marcus Peters was like, all right, I had enough. Took off his shoulder pads, walked up to the part of the stands where it kind of indents you know, onto the field to where like the, the players can get a little closer. Stood on the railing and was like, what now? And the fan backed all the way back. And he's like, you talk all this stuff. Why don't you shut up? Pretty much paraphrase. And I was like, it's very funny that you said all this stuff about this guy and how terrible he is and his family and such. But he gets in your face and all of a sudden, like you're peeing down your leg. I, that's what it felt like to me on camera was that happened. It felt like the guy might have said some other stuff. Troy 
ignored what he could. The guy said something else. Troy got upset, started saying some stuff back. Guy put on his camera phone. I will say this, though. General managers don't typically sit around the fans. And if my team is, at that time, 10 and 53, I am probably not going to be sitting amongst the fans. <laughs> um, because I don't think they have many nice things to say to me at that point. Like, I'm not gonna sit there and be like, "Ooh, I'm cratering this team real bad." Let me sit amongst the people who have actively yelled, "Sell the team," and other things about the organization that I am running. Because I feel like they probably are gonna say something not very nice to me. And you know, maybe sit up where the GMs sit. You know, up higher, away from people. But uh, I'm not gonna say he deserves it. But like, maybe. It's like wearing a salmon, you know, overcoat and then walking by a bunch of bears and you're like, why are you grabbing at me? Like, cause you smell like, like fish, man. Like that's, that's what they do is they do that stuff. So like, I'm not going to fault you for, it, but maybe next time don't, don't do that. So let's get into Detroit city FC because the season is starting for the club this weekend. There's a lot to unpack. I don't think we're going to get to everything that we want to talk about just in the interest of we could do a whole 20, 30 minutes on all this stuff alone. But let's do a quick rundown of things. I think first I want to talk about that uh, there's a new TV deal with CBS Detroit. Fans are going to be able to watch the games for free on, you know, on CBS Detroit, either uh, Channel 50, uh, you know, WWJ, uh, CBS Detroit, or on their website, which I think is going to be a fun thing for fans because there's going to be some people are going to be like, hey, maybe I don't need to do ESPN Plus or Paramount or whatever. Everything except the five national games are going to be on the CBS Detroit website. So this is uh, going to be a new way for people to, to reach stuff. And I think also like a step up as far as like reaching live TV goes. And also it's helpful for those people who live out of the country because I know there's some people who are in Windsor who are fans of DCFC, technically, I guess it'd be South Detroit based off of some people's. For a while, there was a bar in Windsor called South Detroit. Yeah, it's good they embraced it because, you know, some places in the country named Detroit want to be other things like East Point. Yeah, 1.5 million viewers, they said online over the last couple of years for the squad, which is which is pretty great to see. I uh, want to quickly mention, too, Maddie Lewis is retiring. That's one of those changes, unfortunately. That's not a good one. Um, Matt came to Detroit via the New York Cosmos. That's a name. While he's played on some teams uh, before, and even while on Detroit, he went on loan to uh, El Paso, although he didn't play for them. He's really embraced the culture of this team. He's really, it's really resonated with him uh, how much, how important the atmosphere is to, uh, the organization and he, even though he is leaving you could tell in the, in the message that he left how much it left a very big impact on him and it'll be a little big impact on the team because he was one of the starters throughout anytime he was healthy for the team when he played he played it wasn't like a oh he's on the roster but like if he's healthy and you know his legs aren't messed up or his back's not messed up he's on the field losing him is big it'll put more pressure on uh Steve Carroll, Devin Mimensa, and Michael Bryant, the other center backs on the roster, and whoever else they sign going forward. Because um, Matt will be missed. Matt was consistent. Uh, he could score a clutch goal when need be, or he could just get a nice tackle in. And while for someone his size is not necessarily the most fast person, he was quick enough to stay with a lot of shifty players coming through. So having someone like him come off the roster, it's going to sting a little bit. Matty's a class act all the way. So the kits for 2024 were revealed over the weekend. Some strong feelings online. I think the most notable thing is that for the first time in as long as I can remember, the shield, the crest of Detroit City FC is no longer on the home kit. It's been replaced by kind of like a metallic automotive feeling script to me on a kit that actually has a blue chevron. It feels like blue is working its way into the, the color scheme. People had a lot of strong feelings about it. We're very vocal about it. Then I ran a poll on our Instagram, and it's a very divisive kit. Lots of people love it. I did a four-star system, four to one star. Like half the people thought it was three or four stars. Half the people thought it was two or one stars. And really, the strength was not in the middle. It was either I love this thing or I don't. Um, so bold design choices here this year. And we're going to talk about the other kits too real quick. But home kick. There is a website that keeps track of 
all the DCFC jerseys throughout the years are missing a few, but like they keep most of them. And I will say that the while it is very impressive to me between the hardcore fans, the fans who are there part time, the people who just want to watch and a lot of them did not like the jerseys all in unison. They were like, nope, collectively us as one unit. We are speaking as a legion. Uh, we are one. We are many do not like these. But they are not the worst jerseys that they have put out by rating wise. So like that's, you know, you have a rock bottom and they are not there. Personally, I like the black jersey. Like 70% plus of people like the black with the, the verdigris crest. And I got to admit, I, 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 I like it. Some people were like, it's a little bit, you know, basic just having a plain black jersey. But I mean, it's very hard to mess up a plain black jersey. Like that's the thing that makes it, I think, really good in my opinion is if you have you know, a crazy whatever de- design or something else or something that's weird. Like you just get a nice crisp black jersey, maybe do something with the logo, maybe do whatever, but like just keep it a nice plain black jersey. People will be like, ooh, yeah, in theory, I like that. Yeah, and, and seeing it, you know, written on paper, I don't know, but seeing it actually live, I like seeing players play in that. So, I mean, my opinion, I think the the Chevron on the home kit's kind of weird. I know... Uh, that it's coming from the, the the city of Detroit flag. But nonetheless, like I still think it's a little bit jarring to have it in the middle. Um, I understand why they didn't have the crest on it because it f- fit weird on the Chevron, which makes sense. But also, like, did you really need that? People are going to wear them. Uh, although people say they will not buy them. I know people will buy them. Um, so we'll be seeing them in public and be seeing them on the field for sure. And if DCFC finishes higher than seventh or eighth this year and actually makes some noise scoring some goals, people will not care what jerseys they wear. That black kit reminds me a lot of that old smoke kit. And newer fans might not remember it, but it was really cool. They kind of had the billowing smoke coming up from the bottom, which is kind of like the fans trademark with uh, with Keyworth. I really enjoyed that. But you know what? I'm a big fan of lower league kits, and I know that can't always be done. Like, uh, you came into uh, the studio the other day with a very nice kit. I think it was from Minneapolis with, like, this giant gold wing on it. Like, that thing was awesome, dude. In Minneapolis City, playing the MPSL, um, they're known as the Crows. The jersey I had, they typically make white with a black wing or black with a white wing. But they had a special edition with the gold wing, which I was like, got to get that. And they have an even more special edition for Pride last year where it was a rainbow wing instead. Which, of course, playing in lower leagues, you can do stuff like that because it's really more so like, are you playing in a T-shirt? No, an actual jersey? Cool. Nothing offensive on it. We don't really care. But as you get higher in leagues, like they kind of put a limit on what you can put on kits and certain things. So like they have to, I don't want to say be uniform, but they have to be something that is not super crazy. So sometimes you see people try to do something that's crazy, but kind of within, you know, their means and it gets a little crazy looking. Yeah, that away kit kind of echoes the gold side of things. Uh, The goalkeeper kit, it seems like Nate Steinwasher really likes green. I don't know if he selects it, but I feel like it, it suits him well. Now, the alternate goalkeeper kit, I want to mention really quick because it does remind me of my old trapper keeper uh, from the 90s or 2000s with kind of like the crazy pattern or something that maybe like Jason Kelsey would wear. And people seem to like it. I wasn't sure about it myself because almost none of the colors kind of go with the club. But clearly, like nearly 70, 70% of people on our little unofficial Instagram unscientific poll Love this thing with this like very loud design. It looks really nostalgic. I think people might have liked it because it looks like a shirt Rocco would wear in Rocco's Modern Life. It's very, it's very nostalgic with like the angled kind of lightning, light blue streaks through it with like the yellow background. But I mean, yeah, keeper kits are supposed to be goofy. Like they're supposed to be whatever the typically the keeper wants. And that's why DCF he's been green for a while, because I'm sure Nate's like, I want the green. Give me green. Um, I don't think they had an, Im- an input on the on the alternative kit, but it's something that definitely you'll know for a fact that that's definitely the goalkeeper. You'll be no no question about who who's in the net. It's the guy wearing the keeper that looks like it's screaming. Of all the moves that City has made, and I think we might do a, a special around some of this, but of all the moves that they've made coming up to this weekend, what is the player player move that you think is the most important? For me personally, if the midfield keeps progressing the way it's progressing, it's uh, Elvis Amo, who comes by way of Hartford. Um, Elvis Amo is a 
traditional number nine goal scorer. He can score with his head. He can score with his feet, can score with his back to the net, which means typically, you know, he gets the ball, turns and does something for himself. He can make a run and just happen to latch on to a ball that's thrown to him. Very, very, you know, knockdown traditional number nine that they've not had for quite some time. If I had to compare him to a player who I think he reminds me of to a degree, kind of William Mellor's Blair from before. William Mellor's Blair is a bit, not a bit, way faster than Elvis Amo is, but they kind of play similar ways of finding finding seams and exploiting gaps to score goals. So if he can continue to do what he did the previous years, not last year at Hartford, but the years before that, DCFC have someone who's finally going to break uh, 10 goals for them up top, not someone who's going to break it as a midfielder, but someone who's going to break 10 goals for a season of them up top, which will really help them. Uh, because when you have someone who can who the offense focuses on as a result, it lets players like Maxi and new player Villanueva, new player Ali Coot and Ben Morris and Connor Rutz. It lets them now get into the game to try to score something else. But when you don't have someone for the team to focus on, they can just set back and let you throw stuff at the wall and hope that it sticks. So if Elvis Amo does what he's been doing for most of his career, DCFC should be fine uh, near the front. Now, I know on Fridays you're going to be doing some stuff on our newsletter previewing the match for the weekend, but I want to get your vibe check. How are you feeling ahead of this uh, road opener in Colorado Springs against the Switchbacks? Uh, The Switchbacks played during the first weekend of the season, which just happened. Uh, They lost 2-0 to Miami, which is a little surprising because Miami's been known to not have a very good offense, and Colorado's been a team that will run full speed at you. I feel a little bit better, but also I'm a little concerned. Really, because uh, DCF, he's been known for their defense. And with Matt Lewis retiring, like, of course, that's one of their cornerstones of their defense leaving. But even before that, they kind of were leaking some goals. Their last game they played uh, was against Louisville, who just took a sledgehammer to that back line, if everyone remembers that playoff game. So a little bit worried about that. Some of the some of the preseason friendlies against the college teams, they did all right. But against some of the pro teams, they, like against Indy, they gave up three. Not great. New Mexico, they gave up one or two. Not great. I'm a little concerned, especially Colorado signed a player, Ronaldo Damas, who has played for a lot of teams in the league. He went on, He's on loan from a team in Sweden who are currently dealing with some financial issues. But Ronaldo, Ronaldo Damas is fast. Ronaldo Damas scores goals. He exploits spaces. And if you don't have someone who keeps tra- up with him, you'll be watching the back of his jersey as he runs towards your net and slots a ball in. So if they can contain him, I think they'll be fine. I just think that they should make sure to have a plan to keep him contained and keep him away from the net as long as they can. You know, I want to do an Ask Fletcher Anything about the club. DailyDetroit at gmail.com. Leave a voicemail, 313-789-3211. I'll also put the call out on social media. And I got to say, I'm looking forward to the home opener in a couple weeks and seeing you out there on the pitch at Keyworth. For sure. they. I would love an ask me anything. It's just, you know, don't tell me I suck at my job or else I'm going to come beat your ass. <laughs> With that, I'm Jer Stays. And I'm Fletcher Sharp. Thank you so much for listening. Remember that you are somebody and we'll see you around Detroit.